I can't say how excited it makes me to have everyone come to my home country and meet the wonderful people and eat the wonderful food here. Uh, so seriously, people came from all over the world, so I definitely recommend getting to know everyone here. Uh, these are people that, you know, these are the people who have been a part of this, uh, uh, you know, in some form or fashion since we started this thing. And, um, you know, six years later, uh, the fact that I'm standing here in front of everyone is, is frankly mind-blowing and uh, really excited about this. So. So with that, uh, I'm going to kick off my talk, and it's called uh, Believing in the Supranational, and uh, I'll be honest, uh, this talk is uh, not that much about pocket. Um, it is about infrastructure, uh, uh, but not the kind of infrastructure you might expect it to be. Um, I think we're part of something much larger than just pocket. And this is really uh, the culmination of some of my thinking over the last couple of years. Um, this is really why I get up in the morning uh, every day to work on this. And this is, for me, our, our 10 to 20 year plan more than anything. So, um, Uh, but there's also a gap here that, that's missing. Um, uh, and as a result, uh, these gaps of trust is resulting in us believing more in our peers. Um, I'm not gonna go super deep into this, but I think it's worth talking about uh, Rene Girard for a moment and his concept of mimetic desire. Uh, what he basically says is that imitation is the force that shapes human desire. Uh, people desire things because we want to copy each other. Uh, and, the, you know, it's, it's a very human need to believe in yourself or, or believe in something larger than, than yourself. Um, and, again, humanity runs on, on, on mimetic desire. Uh, this is a picture of Ninja, one of the largest popular streamers in the world. Um, that's just one example, but uh, uh, it's, it's literally everywhere in society. Uh, for example, when... I was 18, uh, uh, I discovered Jason Calacanis, I was reading tons of fantasy epics, and I was reading Ayn Rand. And whether fictional or not, a lot of what I read and saw and listened has impacted how we've built Pocket today in a really, truly meaningful way. Uh, and uh, uh, as a result, you know, for example, I'm also a nonconformist, uh, and even nonconformism is a form of mimetic desire. You look at someone, and you say, I want to do the opposite, right? So, so keep that in mind as well. Um, 
But yeah, thanks to the internet, um, we are increasingly looking towards our peers. And uh, this isn't a bad thing, uh, it's just a statement. Uh, uh, and it, it's, these peers are filling in the gaps that, of, these, of leadership, um, of collective belief. And uh, I think uh, one thing that's really importantly missing that uh, 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 as a result of these kind of larger institutions kind of starting to fail us is that we are missing these larger collective beliefs. Um, it's great to have peers, it's great to trust in our peers, but I think to push humanity forward, we need to have collective beliefs. Sorry, I'm, kind of, I'm trying to, I'm, I have no hands here, so I'm trying to do things. And I actually believe that uh, blockchains are filling this collective gap. Uh, there are precious few institutions in this world, uh, whether you agree with them or not, uh, inspire collective belief. Uh, Elon and Trump are two great examples of this. Uh, we used to have collective beliefs in our leaders, uh, but the challenge though, uh, by nature, by believing in humans, they are uh, naturally polarizing, right? And uh, I actually think that uh, blockchains may be the first non-hierarchical collective belief system. Uh, what, I mean, what do I mean by that? Non-hierarchical. Um, we all abide by the same rules within a protocol. And um, while at their core, blockchains are deeply political movements, uh, I actually think it's possible for them to transcend uh, human collective beliefs, uh, actually leading to potentially less polarization. Uh, by their nature, blockchains uh, are credibly neutral. Uh, you can participate in these systems from anywhere around the world, regardless of who you are, what you believe in. It doesn't make a difference. There's no direct identity tied to these blockchains, at least not yet. And I think this is a defining trait of blockchains that, that shouldn't be uh, uh, overlooked. Um, so what do uh, blockchains have in common with religion, governments, and uh, the corporation? Um, they coordinate humans. Uh, blockchains are becoming an institution. Uh, uh, they're actually becoming something we can believe in. Uh, religion, uh, uh, what I believe is the first major human coordination mechanism, brought people under the name of God to do things. Um, uh, we're seeing, you know, for example, the oldest, or one of the oldest living religions today is Hinduism, from like 6,000 BCE, uh, uh, and humans have been incentivized to action uh, 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 through the, the, the coordination of religion. Uh, the oldest governments, like religion, are all known to us. The old one, oldest one is in Mesopotamia, and uh, around 3,000 to 1,000 BCE, we saw ancient Egypt, China, and Greece, and everything that happened in those you know, 4,000, 5,000 years ago has impacted our lives today in a, in a meaningful way. Uh, uh, and also the first corporation uh, came in about the 1600s. And I think corporations have been the strongest driver and quickest driver of change in the history of humanity for this having been for, around for only what, 500, 600 years. Um, I think this is actually partly due to the incentive alignments of a corporation and how you can actually coordinate humans to do one thing uh, uh, really well, although I think there are limits, there are limits to that. Um, so basically blockchains are a human coordination technology and uh, a collective uh, belief system, and I think they're filling this gap. Um, now just think about the, the timing of this for a second. Bitcoin was invented like 12 years ago, and what I'm saying is that these things are on the level of governments, religion, and corporation. And it's fucking crazy that we are on year 12 of this, <laughs> and we are at literally, how lucky do we get to be to be at the ground floor of something as potentially humanity, societal changing as this. Um, and on that timing. Um, this is something we've seen before. This is an excerpt from a book called Generations from Strauss and Howe. Uh, if you've heard of The Fourth Turning, it's, uh, that book is based on this research. Um, and it's really describes, what it does is it describes how every four generations, the same things happen, like, 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 like clockwork. Uh, whether it's I you know, trusted my parents, I you know, let my kids play by themselves, or I want to be a helicopter parent as an example, these things happen societally uh, over and over and over. And every fourth generation, uh, lots of change happens. Uh, and uh, uh, we, millennials, myself, we are actually 
the fourth generation of this next societal change. And the internet has obviously broken uh, and made the world very weird, uh, uh, especially recently. Uh, and I think it's actually gonna get weirder. Um, you know, boomers are slowly falling out of power and millennials are unique because many of us grew without the internet as young kids, but then as teenagers have the internet completely in front of us and have had it since then. Uh, so we actually have a unique perspective of one foot on one side and, and the other. Um, but now we have this world of the internet that's breaking industry, that's changing everything. And uh, uh, the infrastructure that we're using today um, uh, was not built for the internet. Um, uh, uh, we're actually using infrastructure that's 100 years old, 200 years old, or, or even, even older, right? So um, what's happening is I think this is creating, um, frankly, the largest opportunity in the history of humanity, <laughs> not just generations. Um, but this is, the, again, the internet is changing everything. It's accelerating everything. Um, and um, I think we have the chance to build the highway system, uh, uh, something like the highway system, but uh, for the future. Um, you know, the Industrial Revolution uh, caused, you know, for example, the, the US highway system to be built um, uh, as a result of the invention of the internet, or I'm sorry, of, of the automobile. And uh, I think this is the first time we have a communication technology, a supranational communication technology that's not controlled by anyone uh, first. And what I mean by that is, you know, the Gutenberg, the, print, the printing press was built around the context of a government, right? And, and, and spread around the context of a government or even religion, right? The phone was also spread around the context of the government, right? Um, while the government invented the internet, this is the first supranational uh, communication technology that, that supersedes uh, uh, government lines. Uh, 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 and uh, this is uh, pretty important uh, because uh, we have these invention of the blockchains that are starting to add bright, clear lines on this supranational communication technology. Uh, actually adding form to these things, allowing us to uh, uh, communicate and coordinate. Uh, and, and that's pretty important, actually. So. Um, so the question is, is, is how do we go about this? How do we uh, go about um, getting blockchains to rival the power and influence of religion, corporations, and, and governments? Um, well, we don't have guns to coerce people, uh, but we do have incentives. Um, and uh, uh, we've already created an economic system worth over a trillion dollars in 12 years. Right? What happens when this system is worth $100 trillion? Uh, what kind of influence and what kind of change can we really make in this world? Right? Um, and like the corporation, uh, blockchains have incentivized people to do things, right? But corporations have limits. What's the largest corporation? Something like 200,000, 300,000 people? We have millions of token holders <laughs> who are all incentivized to do something. Uh, uh, and as this industry gets bigger, it's going to, by no choice of our own, increasingly interact with the real world. Um, it's great that we built something on the internet, but I don't think we should be escaping to the internet. I think we should build this value on the internet and bring it into real life, because that's where we really live, right? And I think whether through physical infrastructure like pocket, uh, policy efforts, whatever it is, um, uh, we are going to have to do stuff with the real world at some point. Uh, and people are starting to do this already. Um, you know, you could buy an island uh, uh, like, like the Bahamas or, or, or Puerto Rico. Um, there are people who are, uh, you know, looking to buy land around the world and kind of build these kind of crypto, you know, quote unquote utopias, right? Um, I think these are important efforts, um, although there's they're something what I'm calling kind of like concentrated efforts. Um, uh, uh, and while it's important, I think we also need something that's a bit more distributed. Um, uh, and you can't just kind of hole up in your island and kind of forget about the rest of the world. Uh, the rest of the world matters uh, in, a, in a really meaningful way. Um, so we're seeing lots of great concentrated approaches. And what I'm suggesting is that we do um, a more distributed approach to crypto footprints. Um, so we have blockchain coordination and we have the status quo. Um, and we need, I think we need to attack this from, from both sides. Um, while it's pretty easy to create these concentrated communities in, in different parts of the world that are regulatorily friendly to crypto, 
Um, I think in parallel, we need to spread our roots uh, uh, across the world uh, and establish cities and countries as well. Um, uh, we can't ignore the rest of the world as we create this technology, as we create all this digital value. At some point, it's going to become an issue. Uh, and I think it's worth trying um, uh, uh, different approaches. Uh, we, we need to show our value to local communities and municipalities and governments and really have them show how, the, you know, how Web3 has impact, you know, how it's impacted my life, right? Um, I think we can, we can show people how it can impact their lives as well. Um, uh, and like I said before, I don't think we should be building all this digital value and just kind of escaping to the metaverse. We should be taking this and transitioning it to the real world in a meaningful way. Um, and, and transferring that is, is frankly hard. Um, it's hard to work with the real world. Um, so, so the question is, what, 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 does that, what does this have anything to do with pocket? <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, um, if you, like I do, think that uh, Web3 is going to touch everything about the internet and every transaction that we do uh, is, is going to be touching some blockchain at some point in the future. Um, every end user at some point is going to be touching a full node, everyone. Whether it's through indexing, privacy, DNS, it's not going to matter. Everyone is going to need information from a full node. <laughs> and uh, I think this is why I use Pocket and TCP IP as a metaphor for what we're building because I really fundamentally believe that we are going to become the fabric of Web3. And what's really interesting about Pocket is that we are working with physical infrastructure. And while we've got a bunch of gateways around the world today, post 1.0, some person running a node in Sao Paulo, Brazil, is gonna be able to serve their users uh, uh, in South America, or Web3 users in South America. And all of a sudden, uh, uh, we've got an actually fully distributed infrastructure network, uh, which is really incredible. Um, and uh, I think due to this distributed nature of Pocket, we're actually perfectly situated to uh, lead on this distributed uh, 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 kind of hub uh, in real life approach, right? So um, Pocket and protocols like it are supranational. Uh, we rise above governments or any other institution. We have our own rules that are enforced by the internet, but the same time, you know, Pocket, you know, we, we still have a human agreement. Pocket has a constitution that we all opt into, right? It's a social agreement. Um, Pocket is an opt-in democracy, uh, like a government. Uh, it is coordinating physical infrastructure across, I think, 30 countries, more around 30 countries today. And it's also creating a collective faith, like, like religion does, um, uh, as do other blockchains. And over time, Pocket's own treasury, I think, will have tens of billions of dollars, as will other treasuries of other protocols. And I think things like this uh, uh, gives us the opportunity to shift the power dynamics of, of the world and uh, start to bring us uh, uh, a little bit more on par with, with some of these other institutions. Uh, so the question is, uh, how do we get there? Um, uh, forget about employees there, uh, uh, actually contributors. Uh, uh, anyone who is contributing to Pocket, whether through the DAO or on the core team, should be able to move anywhere they want around the world. And I mean this like permanently, like if I want to get a visa somewhere, I should be able to do that. Um, and what I want to do is build a playbook to allow for this freedom of global movement and find these hubs around the world that we can start to grow around uh, and improve. Um, this is hard, this is lots of legal Stuff. Sorry, Adam, if you're if you're listening, uh, 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 but it's it's hard work, but it's infrastructure. It's it's real infrastructure, and um, from first principles, if all we want to do is just allow for global freedom of movement, um, that's I think the first step. Uh, and uh, as we move, um, uh, we open source this playbook and start to work with other protocols and say, hey, look, let's go to Sydney, let's go to Barcelona, let's go to. Dublin, let's go to Santiago, Chile, right? And have places that people can actually go and live and work and, and actually create roots, um, true roots, places that feel like home, right? And as we start to have these places that feel like home, um, uh, we start to improve our localities. We actually start to, and this is the other challenge, right? Uh, improve a road, build a park, 
plant trees, whatever it is, actual physical things that people can feel and touch and experience and show how this digital value that we've created has now been translated into the real world. And I think by Pocket leading on this, this not only helps us recruit the best talent in the world for the DAO and anyone contributing, but it also helps Web3 uh, uh, recruit. Uh, when people start to see that their world is starting to change because of this crazy blockchain thing. Um, uh, and I think with that kind of a path, uh, we can actually set the foundation for, for building a future that we really want to live in that is uh, native to the internet, but touching the real world, right? Uh, I, I, I think we need to avoid this. I don't know if you guys watch Black Mirror, but um, we have enough dystopian uh, uh, stuff out there. Um, uh, and, and I think we can really avoid this. Uh, what I really want to do is, is, is live like this. And um, uh, I think we have the opportunity to do this. Uh, it's hard and it's going to take a long time. Uh, but as the world gets weirder, as countries and cities run out of money, um, uh, and as we start to really embed ourselves around the world, I think uh, through working with these governments, they're going to start to want to work with us. And I think in some cases they're going to want to need us. Uh, and that's kind of when these, you know, powers, uh, uh, these balance of powers shift. And, um, you know, I think Pocket has the opportunity to really um, drive this kind of change. Um, so I mentioned that uh, this, you know, wasn't really about Pocket. I think you're about to hear uh, much, much more about this the rest of the week. Everything is that you hear today is, and tomorrow is, is, is building the foundation for this sort of thing. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, this started with an idea in a car six years ago, and now we're in a room with almost 250 people uh, 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 through this thing. So, um, extremely excited. Uh, this is going to be really fun this week. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, I've got uh, my co-founder, Luis, up next with this nice, uh, with this nice jacket. And, uh, yeah, thank you, everyone.